Hey guys, it's Tori and today I'm doing two book tags, one that I was tagged in by David Wiley and the other I was tagged in by Hannah's Books. And I decided to do both because first of all, I just want to get both of these done. I'm excited about both of them. And I also felt that because one of the tags only has two questions, it should be fairly quickly. It is a bit of a discussion question type tag, but again, it shouldn't take me more than a few minutes and then I'll be able to do the other tag. So starting with the first one that I was tagged in by David Wiley, which was originally created by One Book, One Review, and that is the book buying tag. So the first of the two questions is where do you get books? So I mostly get my books online and the reason for that is is because I tend to have very specific books I want and because I'm a poor college student I don't always feel super comfortable going into a bookstore and just picking up random books just because I'm there and I want to buy something from them and support them but it may not be a book that's super priority for me to read right now that I'm really super excited about it may just be a book that I'm like oh I've seen this and it seems interesting so I struggle a little bit going to bookstores regularly that being said I do try to go a few times a year and every time I go on vacations I always make sure to find an independent bookstore to support wherever I go which I always love to do but yes mostly online specifically thrift books is where I go the most it's an online used bookstore and if you spend more than ten dollars in the US you get free shipping which is always wonderful and they usually especially when it comes to classics have what I'm looking for not always sometimes there are books that are maybe out of print that are actually easier and cheaper to get on like Amazon for a better price but most of the time I do use thrift books Books. So that's where I mostly shop. I also like I mentioned use Amazon and the reason is is because I'm a poor college student like I said and Amazon especially for new releases Amazon tends to have the cheapest prices for new releases And so if there's one I really want to get I usually get it on Amazon just because it's cheaper and I just I, I only have so much money So I need the cheap ones a few other sites. I like to use first of all book outlet They have really cheap new books that I really really like to peruse they don't always have a bunch of stuff that I really want to read so I don't use them all the time but I do sometimes because like I said they usually have new copies of books for really cheap which is always wonderful and then I also use Blackwell's and book depository both because they give free shipping to the US and sometimes there are UK covers that I really really want UK editions of books that I really want that it's easiest to just get it on one of those two sites and I usually compare those two sites on prices because sometimes one has a cheaper price for a certain book than the other so I'll kind of look at that but yeah those are mostly the places that I go to for books but my preferred if I could just like ensure that I got exactly the books that I wanted to get I would probably go to independent bookstores the most because that's my favorite book buying experience is going to independent bookstores but sometimes that's just not possible with what I want to read, but I do try to go, like I said, a few times a year and every time I go on vacation, I'll go to one. Question two is how do you choose what books to buy? And generally just booktube, really just books I hear about on booktube. There are times when I have a certain interest that I may do my own research on that may be, in fact, like with Victorian books, sometimes there's books that I've picked up that I've looked up online and that's where I found it rather than on booktube. But the wide majority of books I read, I tend to get recommended to me through booktube and I'm okay with that. That's where I have the most bookish acquaintances. So it's just easiest to do it that way. I also do sometimes read books that my parents recommend to me or uncles and aunts. Not quite as much just because they don't often recommend books to me, but I do take that into consideration a lot of the time. And every once in a while when I either go into an independent bookstore or sometimes even when I'm browsing online, I'll just put down a bunch of random books that look interesting. Okay, my roommate just walked in, so I need to remember what I was saying. So yeah, basically I do like to sometimes get random books every once in a while when I go into bookstores or I'm just browsing randomly online and just kind of am stress browsing and just wanna kind of use some retail therapy. But I do limit the amount of time I spend doing that a lot because once again, I'm a poor college student and I'd rather spend money on books that I have really wanted to get to for a long time and really want to buy 
as opposed to books that just kind of randomly catch my eye, if that makes sense. So there's the book buying tag. I am not going to tag anyone just because I think today I'm just not prepared to do that. So for both of these tags, I'm probably not going to tag anyone, but if you want to do either one of them, feel free and just let me know down below so I can make sure I watch it. All right, moving on to the second tag, and I'm really excited about this one. I just, I really like the prompts in it, and I think it will be fun to kind of tell you guys a little bit more about myself as a reader. This tag was originally created by Rick McDonnell, and like I said at the beginning, I was tagged by Hannah's Books, and I'm, like I said, very excited to do this, so let's just get into it. There's 26 prompts prompts so it may take me a little bit but some of them I don't have a ton to say about so we'll just kind of breeze through as much as we can. Okay, so the first prompt is reading the last page first and I'm absolutely out on this one. I actually used to read the last sentence before I started a book, which was so silly of me. I don't know why I did it. And it wasn't like I regularly did it. I would just every once in a while decide to read the last sentence. And sometimes it was a bit of a spoiler, especially in series, there could be some spoiler. I remember one in particular that I read the last sentence and I was so mad at myself for reading it because it was definitely Definitely a spoiler and it was one that I totally understood I mean I didn't completely understand how they got there but it still you know ruined the shock factor for me a little bit at the end I mean I guess I kind of got the shock factor a little bit but anyway I do not do that anymore I am very out on that I don't really understand people who do in fact my mom will do that sometimes which I <laughs> I don't get but anyway I feel like it's kind of a mom thing like I feel like I've heard a lot of people say that their moms will do that and I don't I don't get it so anyway prompt two: enemies to lovers and I think I'm going to say out on this one I do feel like it just can be a little too angsty for me and it doesn't always it it makes for very unhealthy relationships most of the time. I haven't really seen it where it doesn't create a really unhealthy relationship, so I usually don't love it. I do see sometimes the entertainment value of the angst that's involved in such love stories. However, I think I would prefer a little bit more of maybe like a romance that's kind of like an attraction that's there, but it never comes to fruition because it's just too toxic and not really right for either of them. So I kind of do like the idea of kind of a little attraction between two people who are on opposite sides of a war, so to speak, but I would prefer it to just never come to fruition because they both know, or at least one of them knows, maybe the good guy knows, that it's just not going to work and it's dangerous and they're not a good person and you can't trust them, but you still have that little bit of attraction. I do prefer that, but complete like enemies to lovers, I'm out on that. Question three is dream sequences, and I'm going to be totally honest, I can't even think of books with dream sequences. I know that there are some and I know I've read some, but I'm going to say out on this just because it never stands out to me and I don't really care for it. And I mean, I'm sure there are some good things about dream sequences, but the fact that I genuinely like, they don't stick in my mind at all kind of tells me that they're just not worth it. <laughs> like just tell the story, I guess. And I don't, yeah, I'm gonna say out just because they apparently do literally nothing for me. Prompt four is love triangles, and I'm gonna say in for this one, but I'm going to say specifically primarily in classics because I wanna say in because even though I really don't love a lot of more recent creations of the love triangle, more popular creations of the love triangle that are around now. I absolutely love classics with love triangles because I feel like back in that time period, those time periods when these classics were written, marriage was a lot more complex than just I love them. And I mean, it can be nowadays too, but there's much more of an expectation of love in marriage. Like that's the biggest thing usually. Whereas back, you know, in the 19th century, it was a financial proposition, especially for women. And there were family concerns to consider and titles and a lot of other things that needed to be considered when considering marriage outside of love. Like love was very secondary. And so I feel like they end up being a lot more interesting because they're so much more complex. So when you have a love triangle in a class, 
classic, they may not always end up with the one they love. They may end up with someone who just can provide for them the best. And Hardy, for sure, is one of the kings of love shapes in classics and he does a great job of not all of his books end up with the ones who love each other being together and he also discusses you know what actually is going to make a good marriage like is it really like passionate feelings but those tend to fade and he really recognized that in his own marriages and yeah those romances tend to fade that passion tends to fade and so what is left and so maybe there are other considerations that would make for a better marriage for certain people and so i really 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 like that when it's done well and i think there are some recently written books that probably can do love triangles like that i just haven't really seen them so i'm gonna say in because i do love it in classics but I definitely am a, I am picky about it like I don't love love triangles in general but when they're done in a way that's good I am a sucker for it like I absolutely adore it so prompt five is cracked spines and this is one where I don't really care that much like I'm one that I buy a lot of used books and often they have cracked spines and it doesn't bother me too much and I, but I do try to avoid cracking the spine as much as possible like if it ends up getting cracked it doesn't destroy me inside or anything but I do try to avoid it as long as possible so I'm going to say out just because I know that personally I do try to avoid that but it doesn't like bother me that much if that makes sense question six is back to my small town and I think for this one I would say I think I would say in on this one I don't have super strong feelings about it it's not like I love it but I do tend to enjoy it. I will say I don't read a lot of contemporary. I do read some, but not much. And so I don't always necessarily care for it in more contemporary stories for some reason. However, in like historical fiction, classics, and honestly films, I actually do like it quite a bit. I don't know. It just kind of depends on how it's set up, I think. But it can be done really well, and I don't really have anything strongly against it. So I'm going to say I'm in on it because I do enjoy a lot of stories that have that trope in it. And, you know, I do enjoy my Hallmark movies, my Hallmark Christmas movies, and that's pretty much all of them are like that, just about. So anyway, prompt seven is monsters are regular people. And for this one, I'm going to say out on this one. It never really, I don't know. I feel like it can be done well, but it's not something I really gravitate towards. It's not something that really hits me. It's the kind of trope that I feel like once I read it once, I feel like I can get out of it everything that I am gonna get out of it, if that makes sense. So I feel like every other time it happens and that I read it, it no longer does the same thing for me. And so, yeah, I'm gonna say out. I'm not super strong. I don't have super strong feelings about that. I feel like they're fine, like I said, but similar to like dream sequences, it just doesn't do a ton for me and isn't super memorable for me. Prompt eight is no paragraph breaks and I am going to say out on this one. I don't even think I've read anything like this, but it just sounds awful. And I just think there's no, I just can't even think of a good reason why you would have no paragraph breaks. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem like it would really do anything for me except for annoy me. So I'm just going to say out on that. Prompt nine is multi-generational sagas. And I have not read very many of these, but the couple I have read I've enjoyed. I I think I like the idea of it more than I love the execution. Like I think it sounds fun, but I feel like in the few I've read, even though I've enjoyed them, I haven't like loved them. But I'm going to say in because like I said, I haven't read that many and I do really like the idea of that. So I feel like if I continue to read that type of literature, which I do want to, I mean, I have a few books that I know are kind of generational sagas or books on my TBR even that I don't own yet, but that I am interested in reading that have that family saga type storyline. But 
I that could change I could say out at a future point as I read more but I'm going to say in for now because I think they always sound fascinating to me 10 is rereading and I am so in on this I love rereading I wish I could do more of it I just feel like there's so many books I need to get to that it's hard and especially with my reading pace it's hard to reread as much as I would like to but I do really love it when I can and I think a lot about rereading because there's a lot of books I would love to reread and yeah I'm absolutely in on rereading and I don't really understand people who aren't like I can understand the idea of like there's so many books to read I don't want to go back but there's just so much more you can get out of a book on a reread and it can be a whole new experience for you even if you've read it before and you know the story you can catch so many more things and remind yourself of things that you forgot about and I feel like that's just a fun, great experience. 11, Artificial Intelligence. I have not read much with this, but I love it every time I see it, so I'm definitely in on this. I really enjoy an artificial intelligence story. Again, haven't read much, but I've liked it a lot, and I think it's very creepy. It adds a very creepy element to sci-fi, in my opinion, because a lot of the time with artificial intelligence, they end up being too smart for their own good, but without any feelings. And so it may, creates kind of a monster, but at the same time, you understand like all their reasons because they're thinking very logically because they're a computer, <laughs> but they just don't usually, they don't have feelings. They don't have the same feelings we have as humans. And so they can do terrible things for reasons that make sense, but they're still terrible things. And so I always find it very fascinating to read that type of plot line, that type of trope. 12, drop caps. I'm in on this one too. I absolutely love the look of drop caps. If you don't know what drop caps are, they're basically where at the beginning of each chapter, they put a capital letter for the rest of the chapter. And usually it's like decorative in the first word. And I think it looks really nice and I absolutely love it. Prompt 13 is happy ending. I'm in on this. I do. I am one that I do like a tragic ending. I do like that a lot, but I would hate to only have tragic endings. Like I like having happy endings as well. And so I would never trade one for the other. I would I just like having both. So definitely happy endings I am in on. 14 plot points that only converge at the end. And I'm a reader that I love book endings. Like that's the most important part to me. I need a really good ending, a pretty strong middle, and then I don't care how the beginning is. Honestly, it can be a weak beginning because I'm pretty patient with books and I'm willing to do the work to get to the good stuff. I know a lot of people need a good beginning in order to be drawn in, but I just, I really don't. I mean, there are certain books that maybe start off in a way that it really pulls me out, but most of the time I don't care how slow the beginning is. I just, if there's a good ending, that really impacts how I feel about the book as a whole more than anything else. I mean, it, if it has a really good ending, but not a very good rest of the book, I'm not gonna give it like five stars, but it will improve my feeling of the rest of the books because a lot of the time that ending pulls in the rest of the book in a way that just really works for me if it has a good ending. And so with this, I'm going to say in because I do enjoy where I get to the end of the book and I've kind of felt like, what is going on? I don't know. And then it all comes together in the end in a really interesting way. I really enjoy that. I can understand people not enjoying that, but I'm a reader that the ending, like I said, means a lot to me. And so I enjoy when things really come together in shocking and fun and good, strong ways. Um, in the end of a book. So I would say in on that. 15, detailed magic systems. And this is one where I honestly, a lot of the fantasy books I like the most are not super detailed magic systems. They're a lot more of a soft magic system, so not as complex. So I do kind of prefer a soft magic system, but I have nothing against harder magic systems, more detailed magic systems. In fact, I do enjoy a lot about it. I just tend to lean more towards books that don't have that. So I'm going to say in because I do enjoy it when it is done well. I do enjoy getting the detailed magic system and I find it interesting. I just don't need it in order for me to enjoy the book. 16, classic fantasy races. And I'm going to be boring and say, and again, I enjoy classic fantasy races. So like elves, dwarves, all those different kinds of 
common um, fantasy races. I really enjoy like in Lord of the Rings, Chronicles of Narnia, all those. I, yeah, I am kind of a classic fantasy lover. Like I prefer those medieval, magical, whimsical type worlds, fairy tale type worlds are my favorite fantasy worlds to be in. I can always appreciate someone who breaks out of that mold, but I do really, really like it. 17, unreliable narrators. And I'm going to say in, because I do think there's a lot of interesting things about this, but I don't necessarily care all that much. Like, I'm not super passionate about having unreliable narrators. I do think it adds interesting things to the story, but I think there are other things that are more interesting to me than unreliable narrators. That being said, I still would say in just because I do enjoy it. Like I do genuinely enjoy when there's an unreliable narrator. It's just not a priority for me. 18, evil protagonists. And this is an interesting question because I don't know if he means like an anti-hero because I do enjoy a good anti-hero and I think that's very fascinating but if it's like a protagonist that you're kind of supposed to like a lot like really enjoy and think they're like doing great but they are evil i don't necessarily like that um and i even anti-heroes it has to be done well they just have to be complex i do i'll say i'll say in on this one as far as anti-heroes like i think of like heathcliff from wuthering heights who is awful and horrible but i find him very fascinating so i do like characters like that a lot and i think it's interesting when they're kind of the main character and we're seeing them as this anti-hero type character, or even just, even if it's a book that's meant to be from the perspective of the bad guy, I do find that's very fascinating. I, as long as it's made clear that they're the bad guy, like they're not supposed to be someone you would want to be. <laughs> so I, a tentative in on that depending on how it's done. Prompt 19 is the chosen one and once again uh, this one's hard for me. I feel like the chosen one trope can be done very poorly and very um, lazily. I think the chosen one trope however can be done pretty well because I think my favorite thing with the chosen one trope is seeing this person who's deemed the chosen one who is still very flawed and still usually pretty young and who has a lot to learn, who is able to say, okay, like I feel like there's this argument that like they're the chosen one just because someone said they are, but I really like it when it's kind of made to show that yes, someone's kind of been told that they're the chosen one, but they don't just bank on that. They really recognize that they need to do their part. They kind of take on that responsibility. So even though it seems like it's this destiny forced on them, there's also the sense of they have their agency of how they're going to take that on, how they're going to take on that responsibility and role. It's kind of like, honestly, like a person being born and is like the child of the king and they end up finding out that they are meant to be king like king arthur where they end up deciding you know what i can either like be arrogant i could be an awful chosen one i could be very arrogant and prideful and power hungry or i can make myself into a person who is worthy to be the chosen one and i so i feel like that is very well done so i'm gonna say in because i do like it for the most part. I think there are some stories where it's not done as well, but I do think it can be done really well and I enjoy it. Prompt 20, when the protagonist dies. And for this one, I'm going to say out, just because I rarely see it done well. I feel like a lot of the time it's used for shock factor. However, I'm going to caveat that by saying it can be done well. It can be done very well. And for example, one of my favorite books of all time, I'm not going to mention which one it is because I don't want to spoil anything for people, but I do have a favorite book of all time that uses this trope and it's done very well because it really hits home for what the book is trying to teach. And so it can be done really well, and I like it when it's done really well, but I haven't seen it done super well in a lot of the books that I've read. But it is possible. 
So I'm going to say out just because even when it does happen, it's not like something that draws me to a book, but it can be very well inputted into the story. And so I'm not going to say completely out, but for the most part out. 21, really long chapters. I'm out on this one too. I mean, it doesn't completely crush my soul if there's long chapters, but I do prefer short chapters. And I just feel like it's kind of a pain to have such long chapters that it's impossible to get to the end of one before you need to stop reading and then you have to stop in the middle of a page which isn't the worst thing in the world but it's not the best either so i'm going to say um, no 22 french flaps and these are the ones where with paperbacks they actually have like a little flap kind of like the dust jacket jackets on hardbacks and i really like the look of those so i'm going to say in on that i think they're really pretty 23 deckled edges i know a lot of people don't like them but i do honestly i think they look nice and i feel like people say that they make it hard to turn pages but i've never found that to be the case i don't know how they turn the pages but I have never felt like it made it that hard to turn pages in a way that was noticeable to me at least. So anyway, yeah, I'm going to say in on that as well. 24 signed copies by the author. And I think it's fun, but I'm going to say out because I don't really care. I don't feel like it does anything for me. And yeah, it just doesn't really get me excited. I feel like I'd be more, if I wanted a signed copy, I'd want like a signed copy by like an author that's dead. <laughs> <laughs> by like a classic author where I can have you know their signature but I'd be just as happy having anything like an original edition of their book even if it wasn't signed like so having it signed is not necessarily a huge deal for me um pretty much ever so I'm going to say out 25 dog earring pages I'm going to say out because I do try to avoid doing that and I prefer not to in my own books. Like I just, I would rather have a bookmark, but it's not because of the idea of like folding the page over. It's more because I find often when you like accidentally drop a book or something, sometimes the dog ear page ends up getting messed up. And if it's a book that has had a lot of dog eared pages, it can be really hard to find where you were at. So I feel like bookmarks just do a much better job of saving my spot. I mean, not always bookmarks can fall out and Stuff, but I just do prefer bookmarks to make sure that my place is saved It's a lot easier for me to find where I was most of the time But I'm not one of those people who see other people dog ring pages and freak out like I don't care <laughs> I don't care and there have been times where I can't find a bookmark and I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just dog ear it So it doesn't bother me very much But I do prefer to use a bookmark So I'm gonna say out just for that fact just because my preference is to not dog ear pages 26 chapter titles instead of numbers and I'm gonna say in on this I do prefer chapter titles as opposed to numbers. I I don't know why. I mean, I don't have anything against chapter numbers. It doesn't bother me, but I just think it's kind of fun to have a chapter title where it kind of introduces you to possibilities for what you're going to see in that chapter. And I think that's kind of fun. Okay, and then that was the last prompt, but I keep wanting to go back to number 20, the protagonist dies. And I'm going to say in on that one, actually. I said out originally, but the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know what? I actually do enjoy, really enjoy when that's done well. Anyway, that is the end of that tag. This is definitely a much longer video than I usually make, so I apologize for that, but it was fun. I really liked all these questions. It was interesting to think about. Let me know down below some of your answers to these questions as I would love to know. Thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to you next time. Bye!